preferred ways. Uh, I have the longest email, I think, of anyone I've ever met. But if you email me, chances are I'll get back to you, especially if it's about an open education issue or you want to get involved with our conversation. Also, you can find me broadly on social media at the handle Lashley Ed. And to kick things off, I want to start with another speaker, actually. As we in Idaho work on our goal to advance opportunity for all Idahoans, uh, the affordability and accessibility of it is critical. Open educational resources are one of the best avenues to get there. It allows the professionals in the classroom to customize the curriculum uh, for each unique student or each unique group of students. Uh, this is just a classic example of using today's modern technology, using our professionals in the classroom with the best practices that are out there to make big advances in educational attainment for all students in Idaho. I have an official proclamation from the Office of the Governor. Whereas the provision of accessible, affordable, and transformative learning opportunities is of paramount importance to the success of students throughout the great state of Idaho. And whereas Idaho's public schools, colleges, universities, and the State Board of Education support open educational resources, or OER, and related practices to inspire collaboration between educators to adopt, adapt, and create novel, relevant instructional materials. And whereas, the adoption and revision of OER encourages educators to reclaim their curricula from third parties and personalize instruction to better engage students. And whereas the Idaho citizenry is made stronger as open educational practices empower students to become both consumers and producers of knowledge, and whereas Idaho's educational community pursues open education as a sustainable means of making public education more adaptable and resilient in future contexts, and whereas the International Educational Opportunity celebrates Open Education Week to raise awareness and showcase the impact of open education on teaching and learning. Now therefore, I, Brad Little, Governor of the State of Idaho, do hereby proclaim March 1 through the 6th, 2021, to be Open Education Week in Idaho. Signed, Brad Little, Governor of the State of Idaho. Show it again. And uh, how about that? It's one of those, those moments, I think, in at least my last four years of working in Idaho higher ed, that it always seemed like we get to this place. But I think it really speaks to the power of this conversation, the persuasiveness of it, that uh, this is actually officially Idaho Open Education Week for the first time. Okay. And also, uh, as Kristen mentioned, if you want to talk about this on social media and get trending, I suppose, uh, we have a hashtag, it's OE Week Idaho. But this is a welcome session, as well as a general just survey overview of where the conversation is, at least as I see it. Uh, a part of my role in the board office is coordinating open education initiatives across the state which really what that means is me going out and exploring all the good work that is already going on and helping provide platforms, resources, and support for, for people to realize their goals as aligns with open education. So uh, real quick shout out to Idaho State for their efforts in organizing this. We did have a committee, but really, um, and specifically Kristen Whitman and Daphne Singh, they, they led this effort this year and we really appreciate Idaho State hosting this year's events. Uh, and I also want to you know, give a shout out. I do this often, but the Idaho State Board of Education really cares deeply about this issue um, as evidenced by the proclamation. And I'm really grateful for the platform that they're giving all of us. 
As Krista mentioned, this is our planning committee. Uh, many of these collaborators I've worked with for a number of years. And uh, this is the sort of group that you would be networking with if you decide to start um, participating in email threads and weekly meetings with us. And of course, any of these meeting obligations are completely drop in and drop out. But uh, Bob Casper, he's a great supporter of uh, designing with OER as an instructional designer at Boise State. Uh, Daphne got a lot of shout outs last week and you'll, you'll see this in the videos um, that ISU posted for her work in terms of pairing faculty with not only instructional design support, but also the technology that they need to realize some of their goals. Uh, Harold Crook single-handedly launched one of the, um, I think, most interesting low-cost course material initiatives in the state up at Lewis Clark. And I know later this week he'll be talking about that program. Uh, Kristen has really been the, the project manager and organizer on this. And she's actually out of this list. She's my um, most recent collaborator. Uh, I've only known her, uh, I think, for about a year now. And it's pretty incredible just where the conversation's gone in our state just in the last year, but also at ISU specifically. Uh, Marco is going to be leading a panel after this session, and he's at the University of Idaho as a librarian and open education advocate, and just a, a great deep thinker on this topic and the ethical implications related to open. Uh, the same could also be said for Monica Brown at Boise State, who works in their eCampus center. She uh, has been working with faculty to develop press books, specifically around online learning contexts, and to those of you who are familiar with online learning, you know if it's well designed for online, then those course materials or that course is going to apply to a variety of different settings. Uh, Rob Nyland, who's also at Boise State, but uh, will be soon leaving us. He's been probably one of my closest collaborators over the years, especially on issues of open, uh, uh, open education research. And uh, he's, a, he's a great person to know. And then finally, and last but not least, uh, Ryan Randall, who is another library colleague, but at College of Western Idaho. And he has uh, more recently appointed their press books admin. So it's a good group of people. These are just the ones who are really actively involved with every step of the planning process for this event. But our network is larger than this and it continues to grow. And so please join us in conversations and please join me in thanking them for their hard work in putting together this week's events. Also, uh, importantly, I think we're owed, we need to owe a, a debt of gratitude to the Native peoples of Idaho. And so I, I prepared this statement for us. Uh, public schools and higher education institutions in Idaho exist on the homelands of Native peoples who have lived in this region from time immemorial. We occupy the traditional homelands and waterways of five tribes, some of which are nations and confederacies that represent multiple tribes and bands. The original and current take holders of this region deserve our gratitude. By embracing open education and the conviction that educational opportunities should be available for all people, Idaho's academic community has a responsibility to pursue relationships with these tribes, support their tribal sovereignty, and celebrate their voices in teaching, learning, and research. And I encourage you to learn more about these tribes through the Wikipedia category, Native American tribes in Idaho. And I reference Wikipedia, of course, contextually, because Wikipedia is one of the most prominent open educational resources that exists. So open education, I have tried to take all the complexity of open education. And if you view my asynchronous video that I recorded last week on the basics of OER, you'll understand that there's a lot more to the discussion than just a small graphic. But open education is a global movement to democratize access to meaningful lifelong learning opportunities. And we go about this in in, in my mind, in three primary ways. Through open licenses or licensing of content, a formal granting of permissions. And it's important that that permission is explicit so that you can guide use. Uh, one of the applications of open licenses that's well known is open educational resources. These are teaching, learning, and research resources that are openly licensed or they reside in the public domain. And the availability of these open educational resources engender open pedagogy, practices that prioritize open creation and maintenance of knowledge with others. It's about sharing and exploring new ways of promoting access to knowledge. 
I like to start with some shared definitions. Hopefully these definitions will scale and buoy you throughout the week. Uh, and so I like to talk about open in the context of how other people talk about open with regards to open education. David Wiley, uh, the man who coined the term open content and is seen as one of the, the early prominent figures of the modern open education movement, for many years referred to open as free plus permissions, free meaning free of charge, permissions, um, again, being associated with those open licenses. Uh, to be more descriptive, he started evolving that definition to free plus a granting of permissions, recognizing that an author is granting permission to others to adapt and modify and revise um, one's, one's intellectual property. Uh, Ryan Merkley, the former CEO of Creative Commons, Creative Commons being one of the, the primary formal open licensing uh, organizations, I was privy to a keynote of his where he was putting forward the definition of 5R permissions plus value. Uh, 5R we'll talk about in just a second, but these are the sort of affordances you get through open licenses and specifically through Creative Commons. And value taking a conversation that's often predicated on cost and how do we eliminate cost or how we dramatically reduce cost to be, I think, a little bit more constructive where he's talking about value. The idea that you can have free resources that are also incredibly valuable and can maybe even uh, maintain relevance across a lifetime. One I like to play around with just because I like the word important. Uh, I was re-watching my video from last week and I think I used the word important just in speech probably 150,000 times. But again, I think the importances are really important and having explicit license to do things with content is necessary for just the security of being creative with, with someone else's work. But then the importance, again, buoying that concept of value and also the ethical imperative that we make sure the work that we're doing and sharing and releasing um, openly is portable, it's accessible, not only in lowercase a accessibility that's available, but also it meets modern standards and evolving standards of accessibility and consideration. And effectively, it's going to create meaningful importance for other people. But one that I also love is just the general feeling that you get when you talk about openness, openness as an emotional positive thing. And I, I rely on this on a regular basis, this tweet from my colleague, uh, Christina Hendricks, who coincidentally is an Idaho native, but she runs the um, Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of British Columbia. And she was doing some research and found this great line from 1975 uh, where uh, Hill, who has an advertising background, is talking about open as it relates to open education and says that immediately one uses it, the word open, and options polarized. To be open, depending on context, is to not be closed, restricted, prejudiced, or clogged, but free, candid, generous, above board, mentally flexible, future oriented. I think these are all qualities that we want to find in education. And for those of us who are advocates of open education, I think this is a, a, a common rallying cry. Open licenses. Oops, I missed one. Oh no, oh no, we're going backwards. Here we go. Open licenses often look like this. Creative Commons is probably one of the best known, if not the best known, um, organization providing open licenses today. We see them all over the place, everything from TED Talks to OpenStax textbooks to individual websites. And when I was discussing explicitly giving direction about what to do with the content, uh, this is what I'm talking about. We have in technical terms, a CC BY license means that you need to offer recognition to the original author. Share alike means you're using the same license, but also authoring a, a original, um, credit to the author. Non-commercial NC means you can't sell it. ND means no derivatives. And sometimes you might see uh, a PD or a CC zero, which just means it's part of the public domain. And we can get way into the weeds, but that's not what I'm here for today or this morning. Again, I encourage you, if you have time to spare, either check out the session that I recorded last week with Kristen or uh, visit the Creative Commons website for more information. But important for this conversation are these affordances I was talking about earlier with the five R's. 
the ability through open licensing to retain content, copy it and keep it forever. Uh, the ability to reuse it forever. The ability to revise, modify, remix and improve freely this work. And I already use the word remix, but just to further emphasize remix, combining original open content with your own original work to create super content, super open content through a remix and redistribute otherwise share widely. Um, all of this work is predicated on the interest in others of sharing for the benefit of society, for our community. And so in context of education, open content is free of cost, meaning it's available. It's malleable, meaning it's relevant. You can adapt it for different contexts, learning environments and so on. And it's authorial, meaning that people who get in the practice of using open content likely become editors and authors and share that content again. And this breathes new life into that original piece of knowledge. This is how we keep building and maintaining knowledge over time through open educational resources. And we are. The Hewlett Foundation tends to be regarded as, as the group whose go-to definition for OER is the most exhaustive and specific. And so open educational resources to them, and I think to many of us, are teaching, learning, and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost to access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. Open pedagogy is something that materializes again with OER in the mix as a tool that educators can use in their classrooms. And what I like is that it buoys what would otherwise just be um, good pedagogical practice and makes it sustainable. And so Stephen Downs, a thinker and, and futurist of sorts on education back in 2007, in the context of OER was talking about use and that the use of a learning resource through adaptation and repurposing becomes the production of another resource. Though there's a steady stream of new resources input to the network by volunteers, this represents not the result of an OER sustainability project, but the beginning of it. Every new use, every new share is new content that might manifest itself in different ways through others' new use. It's, uh, if you're familiar with the, the, the metaphor of the rhizome, it's rhizomatic. And here's a diagram kind of rough, roughly laying out what open creation as pedagogy looks like, where whether it's you're sponsored formally by an institution uh, through one time or exceptional funding, or the fact that you're just a salaried educator who has initiative, uh, authors are creating content that can use, be used for educational purposes, openly licensing it, in this case with Creative Commons, What's important, however, is just because you openly license something doesn't mean that you're waiving your copyright. It doesn't mean that it's no longer your intellectual property. In fact, Creative Commons functions more like a wrapper around that IP, telling people exactly how to ingest it, how to use it, what to do with it. And so then it gets passed on to learners who in certain specific educational contexts and class settings and assignments become authors themselves. And there are going to be a number of sessions this week where faculty have been experimenting with this and exploring this in their classrooms in Idaho, not just recently, but for many years. But it's important to keep in mind that OER is just a means to an end. It's a means to an end because really when we're talking about open education, we're talking about relationships relationships between knowledge, learners, and instructors, relationships between sharing the goals of people who occupy the same space, digital or otherwise, and collaborations. And importantly, the relationships between reuse, remaking something and revising content. And the way I like to think about it is that we have an educative responsibility to the current practices that exist in education the open practices that may exist and that we may pursue and the ethical imperatives of the moment. For educators, we have a calling to rise 
to address inequity, to address the moment that we're in for the learners that we have, because that dynamic, that environment, that cohort is always changing and always evolving. And OER is a means of getting there. So at 10.25, I seem to be right on time, but I wanna talk briefly about the state of open in Idaho specifically, because it's a cool state to be in right now with regards to open education. Uh, there are active state and institutional groups. There's state level policy redevelopment happening, taking place right now. There are common tools and resources that have emerged statewide and there are professional learning opportunities that continue to grow and expand over time. Oops. So in Idaho, we have active state and institutional groups. This is a picture from uh, Open Education Conference in Anaheim a few years back where many of the people around this table at Roscoe's Chicken came from Idaho, but we were also there with other cohorts of people who we had met from other states, either through the conference, through Open Education Twitter, which is one of the only good places to be in Twitter. And also because many of us in Idaho have been fellows of the Open Education Group's OER Research Fellowship and so we were introduced to a number of people just through the common affinity of trying to grow empirical research into the efficacy of open educational resources and open practice in education. And so we have uh, the state group that's sort of ad hoc and casual. It's never been formalized, but it hasn't, it ha it hasn't had to be because our grassroots efforts have been um, productive and persuasive enough. But I also know that increasingly institutions are forming their own open education committees. If you wanna know who to get in touch with at your institution, uh, please reach out to me. Or if you see any names associated with your institution from presenters this week, reach out to them as well. Typically those folks tend to be in the know, maybe they're chairing members of the committee, maybe they're members on the committee. Regardless, we can get you in touch with people who uh, have common affinities and are trying to figure out what is my place and what can I do to support open education in our state. Uh, we are a odd state, but in a good way, uh, when it comes to educational governance. We have a common state board of education that oversees K through 20 public education. And as a result, we have policies that prove to be not only fairly impactful, but impactful across the life of a learner. So in my work and, and the work of my colleague, TJ Bliss, our responsibility to board policy is specifically section three on academic affairs. And we have a policy, I'm sorry, post-secondary affairs. And we have a policy on instructional material access and affordability that we're currently in the process of revising. And to talk about the sort of relationships that I was highlighting earlier, demystifying the process and opening it up for collaboration with others has been a high priority, not only in uh, this policy's development, but any policy work that we're doing at the board office, because policy should be appropriate, again, and evolving with the times to address the concerns and changes and innovations that happen in education. And this is a, a really clear example of that. We've had a group of, I can't remember exactly how many, but at least a couple dozen uh, faculty and stakeholders from across the state who have been in regular conversation with us over the last few months addressing a policy that overtly talks about open educational resources, but is missing some important nuance. For instance, uh, our, our current policy doesn't do a sufficient job in my mind of recognizing the great work that is already taking place and trying to find a good way to quantify that as, as a, a, on a place on a scale or a spectrum to openness because openness or going open is just not some switch you either toggle on or toggle off. And if you can't be fully open, then you haven't done it quite well enough. Uh, there are structural limitations, there are learning limitations, um, and there are additional opportunities that need to be considered in how we open up pedagogy, curriculum, course content, and so on. And so we are now rounding a curve on this where we're gonna start uh, workshopping more globally this policy. The initial draft is complete and we're looking to get this implemented um, within the next year or so. And this is, it's rare for a policy to exist at this level instead of just at the state level. So it's exciting that 
our academic community has really been the ones drafting this and guiding this work. We have common tools and resources, um, increasingly so. So every institution in our state has a Pressbooks EDU account. Uh, we also have a state level Pressbooks instance called the Idaho Open Press. Uh, the whole point of that one is to basically be a referatory and to showcase the work that the academic community is producing at the institutions in the state of Idaho and share those resources for broader adoption. One of the groups you'll hear from later this week is an English group um, that over the last year have been collaborating across institutions to spin up an exhaustive open textbook dedicated to English 101 and 102 in our state. And they found out back in December that it's being used already by other institutions as far away as Ireland. So it's pretty exciting to see what can happen when we start really showcasing and promoting the work that again, folks are doing already um, because it's, it's what they need and it's the right thing to do. Uh, H5P is a, is a popular platform for creating inter interactive modules and content and media um, with really broad ranging implications for instruction. There are some other faculty to hear from later this week that will talk about their use of H5P and language instruction and how that has kind of changed what students are, are expecting from different learning environments, digital learning environments in their classroom. And also uh, we recently started a three-year pilot of getting Canvas online for every institution. Canvas is a learning management system, has a lot of great resources, including the Canvas Commons for sharing and publishing open content. And so we look forward to opportunities to explore among different faculty and disciplines how Canvas can be used as yet another tool uh, in our toolbox in forwarding open education. Also, there are broad increasing professional learning opportunities. Over the last year, we piloted a new fellowship program at the state level called the OPAL Fellowships, OPAL standing for Open Pedagogy, Advocacy and Leadership with the sole intent of not just introducing open education to dedicated general education faculty, but really giving them the tools and the resources and the support they need to occupy a position of leadership among other faculty. And importantly, our state has actually been a member of the Open Textbook Network for a number of years, but recently uh, we adapted to a new model of theirs where we are still a consortium of Open Education Network members, but every institution also has more dedicated resources to support the delivery and tracking of open educational resource use at their institutions. And so if you want to learn more about either, please reach out to me. But with that, I want to spare time for some questions. It looks like we have probably 20 minutes or so uh, before we get to our first break. And so the chat should be open. And if it's not, then I need to figure out the controls. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or clarify anything that I may have just kind of hurried over for the sake of time. And Kristen, you are muted. Sorry. Yes, the chat is open. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question, I would actually recommend that you use the Q&A module. It should be there if you have your mouse at the bottom of your screen, um, because those will help us see the questions easier and keep them organized. Uh, if you'd like to type a uh, comment in the chat, you can change your settings to all panelists and attendees to chat with everybody. Okay, we do have a question. Jonathan, can you give a little bit more information about the OPAL program? What sorts of things does it cover? Sure. So the OPAL program uh, it came out of a one-time line item from our legislature. This was a couple of years ago. They approved $50,000 to be directed to specifically high needs, high impact general education courses um, in Idaho. These are courses that are typically fall under our common indexing. There's 43 common index general education courses in our state. And also, you know, they were looking for numbers of enrollments to help buoy recommendations for, for where to develop open educational resources or use open educational resources. They were looking at um, the frequency of which these courses are taught, if they're required, if there's any dual credit implications. And so 
with it being one-time funding, we tried to make sure that we designed a program that was going to uh, offer as much ROI as possible with no expectation that we were going to secure ongoing funding. Uh, what that meant was being very, unfortunately, very selective with where we spent $50,000 because $50,000 goes really quickly in this context, but also, and I think to the credit of the legislature who authored this line item, the, they really wanted to see collaboration happen across institutions. And so this was also an opportunity to get more community college faculty into the mix. This is something that previously I hadn't really seen from a state funding um, position. Part of that just has to do with the shared governance between the four years and the community colleges in our state. But regardless, this was an opportunity where maybe we were gonna be introducing new faculty uh, to one another on the purpose of collaboration and really aligning around specific goals. And so our initial cohort found faculty from math, from English, specifically first year writing, and from um, languages. And so the three languages that were represented were French, German, and Spanish. And technically this first cohort is still completing their fellowships. This is a year and a half program or a three semester program. Uh, part of that was going through the Rebus Communities Textbook Success Program. We were the second cohort and actually the first state cohort to complete that program. Um, and they, Rebus was so excited about us that they actually allowed us to bring in a, a separate group that was non-academic, that comprises librarians across the state. We have a public librarian, academic librarians, and members of the Idaho Commission for Libraries. I think I saw in the attendees today that some of them are in the mix. Uh, so they can talk about their project as well. But that's the fun thing is we're focusing on the affinities of what are our goals and how can open education or open publishing or open licensing help us get there. So for librarians in our state, they're really focused on information literacy and how can we make this content more digestible and accessible and available. Uh, but then for the, the more dedicated academic fellows of the OPAL program with, like I mentioned earlier, with English, it was trying to take all of this mass of open content and open education resources that exist for first year writing and consolidating it down to just what exhaustively these three faculty member or four faculty members thought that they needed um, in their work with other faculty, in their work in teaching their own classes, to try and just winnow their recommendation, recognizing that their recommendation was good enough. They didn't have to create the one piece of open content related first year writing that was going to destroy them all, because there was a lot of good content there, and it could have just been tweaked. And already they're thinking about what is the ongoing maintenance and continuous improvement of this resource going to look like. But also their project is probably the most traditional of the, the um, Opal Fellows. In languages, it was exploring how to deliver instruction, how to shake up assessment, how to make it more interactive, especially because of the digital learning context that arose over the last year. And so tools like H5P or redeveloping new media and content based off of um, older digital textbooks, or updating content for specifically the context in Idaho and the classes that they're teaching. These were all uh, smaller scale OER efforts in terms of the size of the artifact, but still um, just, as not, just, just, just as complex, if not more complex than the open textbook project of the, um, the English group. And then finally, the math group, they hunker down really early on around a common goal. And I know they're presenting on this later in the week. And what's great about that is the goal is persisted from the very beginning and their goal was how do we make non, or how do we encourage non-STEM majors to value math concepts? The math concepts that we teach are valuable, we think they're valuable. How do we repackage these in a way that's gonna be really compelling for non-STEM majors? And that went toward a textbook for a while, that went toward a workbook for a while. And now where it's uh, taken the, the most recent turn is how do we also get other faculty to share this perspective with us. And so they've been going through and documenting the sorts of assignments they're teaching toward this end. And they'll be releasing those in a compendium for faculty to consider adopting at the end of the semester. And so really exciting initial projects for this. What we're exploring right now is what uh, ongoing funding, if we're able to secure it, could look like and how it could be applied, how we could change this opportunity. But I do think uh, just with the, the early outcomes that we're seeing and documenting with this, 
we're drafting at least a really compelling uh, pitch for what the, the future of this program or similar programs could look like at our institutions. So thanks for asking, Martha. Great, so we have another question. Uh, good session. Could you touch on a few more successes and challenges in Idaho to implementing more OER practices? Sure. The and, and was there a name? I love having a name with a, a question. <laughs> yes, answer. this a question is from Stephanie Bailey White. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. So for a long time, I had a really easy answer to that question, and it was awareness. Um, we the, the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome as a state was building awareness and hunkering down around a shared vocabulary or having a shared understanding about what this work is and what it isn't. Uh, I think awareness is increasingly less an issue now, but that's not to say that it's not something we still need to protect. And, and it's something that I try to do with these presentations as well, is making sure that we're starting off with shared definitions or just really explicitly volunteering what my perspective is. Because um, if there's disagreement, we need to make sure that we get ahead of that instead of letting people um, you know, run, run with misassumptions about what we mean when we say open education and what the labor burden of this work looks like. Because there is an invisible labor. Um, there is a cost to supporting open work. And in uh, my, my session last week, because I got into the greater context of where open education is getting really persuasive right now um, in this moment, Cost is a factor not only for students, but also where's the funding going to come from for our institutions when funding mechanisms have also uh, shifted so dramatically over the last 20 years or, or more. And so funding, of course, is going to be an issue because time um, deserves compensation. The, the, the time of our educators, the time of our students, anyone who's making this work happen. Uh, but then that of course leads to time and time being an issue, especially in a year like the one that we just had where we're all effectively living at work, <laughs> to put it poignantly. And, and so what is really vital is in my mind twofold. One, camping in and exploring all the various applications of open practice and OER. So getting out of the mindset that everything needs to be in textbook and the textbook, just because everyone's familiar with the textbook is the simplest way. It might not be. There might just be practices that a faculty member is already pursuing in their classrooms that with a slight tweak could be fully open or actually is open. And we just don't know about it because the faculty members are reticent on sharing out what they're doing in their classes because it's proving beneficial, but they, they don't feel secure in what will happen if they start vocalizing like, hey, I've been doing this cool thing with my students, it might not be appropriate. It might not be um, appropriate to the discipline, to their colleagues, to the, the leadership of their institutions. And I think what I've seen in Idaho specifically over and over again, is that those sort of innovations in the classroom are regarded as appropriate by people in positions of power. The trouble is we don't have great mechanisms, and this is true for all public education in the United States. We don't have great mechanisms for um, identifying, celebrating, and importantly, rewarding that work when we do see it materialize. And so I guess awareness is probably still an issue, but the bigger issue is how do we make sure that our education community feels supported in this work, that they feel appreciated, that they're yielding recognition, especially when we can't assure that they're going to be getting additional um, pay or compensation for the additional effort that they're putting into their classes. And so hopefully that, uh, that they, they give you a few things. And I know that you're speaking a little bit more on, on how ICFL can help out later this week. And so I, I'd love to hear, maybe I'll pose the same question to you during your session to hear what you see as the, the barriers for libraries. Awesome, so we have a couple of comments. Um, Moffitt Jones said that she looks forward to hearing more about the cohorts work, the OPAL cohorts work this week. And there's a comment for you in the chat, Jonathan from TJ, if you wanna take a look. Oh, and okay, great. Well, so Muffet, to further answer your question, uh, TJ has assured me that it's looking like we will have ongoing funding for the OPAL Fellowship. So within the coming months, expect a um, call for new proposals for, Opal 2.0. Awesome. 
Well, this session is going to 10.55, so we definitely still have time for questions. I saw a couple of people join us around the half hour mark. There was a last minute change to the scheduling. Um, so you may have been joining for a presentation that was moved, so I apologize. Uh, but if you have any questions for Jonathan about OER in Idaho, you are welcome to ask them. <laughs> Muffet says, awesome, we'll talk. Sounds good, Muffet. It's been a while. Here's a question from Monica Brown. Just curious, will there be a statewide press books repository in the future? So I, I guess I want to unpack this a little bit more by what you mean by repository, Monica, because um, yes, I want that. And I certainly want to know where our current efforts could be improved. Um, especially because with everyone having shared access to press books, press books being a lightweight, easy to use, relatively easy to use platform for digital authoring that also allows for cloning of books between environments. Uh, to me, it seems imperative that um, we, we use this as a mechanism to share between institutions. And right now, um, Monica, I don't know if you've been to idaho.pressbooks.pub, but the Idaho Open Press, I've been going through and any books that you all have published publicly um, cloning those into our environments because I want to showcase the work that's happening in Boise State. Boise State, to, the, to those of you who don't know, they've had press books for a couple of years now, and so they have a little bit of a head start on some of the other institutions, but that shouldn't stop anyone from trying. And if you have work out there that you've published and you want to showcase um, with the state, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help you showcase your work or fashion your work if it's not in press books, refashion it so that we can share it broadly at that state platform. Monica did ask a follow-up question. Will institutions still host separately, but maybe have a central place to showcase all of that we are? And then said, this is awesome, thank you. Great, so I think I answered the second yeah. question then. I, I think it's really important, and this is true for campus administration as well. I think it's important for the institutions to administrate their own platforms because each institution has its own culture and community and support mechanisms. The other value, though, is with all of us having common resources, we can create affinity groups and communities of practice around the administration of these tools. And so um, those of us who are Pressbooks administrators in the state, we've been meeting on a every two months basis to just talk through what our goals are and what our resources are and what our understanding is and how we're conducting our environments how we're engaging with our, our local stakeholders on using the resource. And it'll be exciting, I think, over the next three years, because this is also a sort of pilot, um, to see what, what sort of validation we get with this, where we have a distributed model in terms of administration, but it's all in service of consolidating and, and having shared outcomes. And thanks for posting the URL in the chat, Kristen. Oh, yes. And um, Memo actually asked me to do that. And I, <laughs> I accidentally dismissed his question. <laughs> Sorry about that. But um, I have posted the, uh, the link in the chat. And then you have, um, next you have a question from TJ. What are some of the biggest challenges to implementing OER at various levels? So this one's going to come from my place of just being a, an, an educator and being someone who supported faculty. Um, it also comes from, I have a pretty deep seated bias now and, and as it relates to just research I've conducted on the topic of OER implementation and faculty and getting faculty buy-in. And it's that um, OER often when, it, when we fail to implement, implement OER initiatives in predictable ways, it's because we have expectations or faculty have expectations shackled to OER that predate OER itself. Um, so super abstract way of saying, often our institutions or those of us who advocate for OER, we're positioning it as a silver bullet, as some new shiny object, as some new thing in a litany of other new things that faculty are often hearing. Oh, now I have to learn about this and, and get involved with this. And the reality is, most faculty 
don't um they and, and they'll they'll side with that it's like time is limited resources are scarce do i really want to spend devote time to learning about this new technical thing this new innovation um but the but frankly and i think this is important to successful implementations is again building on relationships or establishing relationships with faculty to understand what are your goals for your students what are you doing in the classroom already because more often than not and i found this as a practitioner working with staff i found this as staff working with faculty i found this um, in, as a researcher often faculty are doing really thoughtful things in their classes and they're trying to address issues of access and affordability they want students to value the work that's happening in the classes they want students to find value of in-class work outside of the classroom and that might not always fit a truly uh, open definition. At the same time, I'm also surprised how often it does. And again, it can come back to faculty reticence and being concerned that like, I haven't taken the time to really learn about OER and what it is. And so I'm insecure about actually saying that what I do is open practice and what I'm using is open educational resources, but often they are. And so, <laughs> As I keep talking about time and scarcity of time is certainly an issue now. Um, it, it always is, but it's really difficult. I think the prospect of building relationships is always time consuming and, and, and difficult to manage. Um, in a predominantly remote environment, that's probably even more so the case. But at the same time, um, we, we have new mechanisms. So one of the outcomes I've heard from a number of the Opal Fellows in this first cohort is in a way, when we all started physically distancing around this time last March, uh, they weren't accustomed to collaborating across institutions or across the state or across time zones with people through video conferencing in the way that we are now very familiar with. And so for them, they felt like they got to jump on the <laughs> on, on how to cope uh, by having that regular interaction. And I think what many of us have also realized because actually for the last four years, any of the collaboration that we've had across institutions on OER is predicated on these regular meetings, weekly 30 minute to an hour long meetings where we're just building relationships and we're learning about things that people are excited about, questions that they have, concerns that they have, and we're working on them together. And community is what helps us persevere and get through, but you really have to invest the time in other people. Fantastic. Um, we have time for one more question. Or no one would ever be mad for adjourning early <laughs> if no one else wants to ask anything. I have a, I have a comment. Please, more of a comment, really. <laughs> I, I haven't looked at the participant list and how it's evolved since I've been talking, but um, I, I just I really want to convey my gratitude to all of you who are here today and participating in these sessions. And I encourage you to tell your friends, make new ones, and really throughout this week, pay attention to the relationships that you're seeing emerge between people um, and, and the work that they that they do and try and find those points of alignment with your own work, because uh, this is an effort that doesn't have to be just relegated to regular working hours um, and, and though it should if you're looking if you want to maintain a healthy lifestyle and healthy um, home life. That said, uh, we're looking for collaborators and everyone brings their own unique perspective. And so uh, I just encourage you all to find your your passion and and your point of enthusiasm. Fantastic. Okay, so we'll break. We'll start up again at the hour. Um, but for right now, we can go ahead and go on mute and take our break. <laughs>